So this session is being recorded. Um, what we'll do afterwards is I'll publish this online. Uh, it'll, it'll be on YouTube, um, and I'll try and make it. I'll, I'll make it available through to watch back through Zoom as well. So if people are in part of the world where they can't access YouTube, they'll be able to watch it. But uh, I can see we've got quite a few people who've, who've logged in. Um, I'm going to start off uh, explaining uh, who we are and how this is going to run. So first of all, my name is Kim Morgan. I'm the Outreach and Communications Coordinator at UCL Biochemical Engineering. And it's great to have you with us today for the first of our Engineering Virtual Taster Lectures. So this is a series of taster lectures which introduce you to what we do here at Biochemical Engineering and they are presented by our researchers, um, our academics, members of our team who are doing, doing, doing the, the, the really critical work that, that we do in Biochemical Engineering. So um, if you have any technical problems with this session, so if you can't hear us clearly, if the screen isn't working, you know, anything like that, you can let myself and you can let Jack and Luba know in the chat. We'll try and resolve your problems, um, but generally, any problems with audio or video or anything like that, let us know in the chat. Now, we're going to have a Q&A session at the end. Um, if you put, and you can put your questions at any point throughout the session. Just use the Q&A bu button function. So you, if you're on a mobile device, you may not be aware, but you've got little buttons at the bottom which allow you to configure the screen. So you can change the order in which we appear on your screen. Um, but you can ask, ask questions and you can join the chat. That's all in the function buttons. Um, I'm also going to quickly, I'm going to, I'm going to start off as well by launching uh, a couple of polls. This is really helpful for us because we really like to know a couple of things about you in our audience to understand who's here. So the first one is, do you have an offer to study with us? So the, the questions go, um, do you have an offer with us here at Biochemical Engineering? Do you have an offer at UCL generally? Uh, yes, not at UCL or, or no. So this is just for us to gauge whether some of the people are likely to come and study with us or not at all. Uh, obviously, if, you've, if you're not at the point where you're applying for university, but no. Um, but I can see so far we've had uh, most people it looks like don't have an offer to study. Quite a few do with us here because I know because I sent an email to our offer holder so I'm hoping you're with us. Um, I'll leave that run a few more minutes um, and then I'll close that off. Yep, fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. So it looks like most of the people here with us today uh, don't have an offer, uh, so I'll put you down as prospective students. And the other one that I'd really like to know is at what level of study that might be. So if you are coming to study with us, um, can you let us know uh, what level of study that would be? So um, it's so the options are, would it be undergraduate, postgraduate, or neither? So um, I know that some of the sessions we do, uh, we get a lot of prospective PG students coming in. A lot of them are prospective undergrad students. And it looks like at the moment uh, that it's sort of between um, undergraduates, a few neither, and a few post postgraduates. So that's, again, that's really interesting. It's roughly in line with, with with most of the way these sessions work. So so there we go, Luba. So most of them are prospective undergraduate students who don't have an offer to study with us yet. Okay, thank you very much for filling that in. That's hugely helpful to us. So. The pe so just to introduce you to the people that are on, on this uh, session with me, there's Dr. Jack Jeffries. Jack is the admissions tutor for uh, undergraduate programmes at Biochemical Engineering. Uh, he and I will actually be in a session in a couple of uh, weeks' time where, so if you want to find out about studying a degree with us, you can come talk to us about that in depth and we will tell you uh, with great passion about coming and studying a degree with us. Um, uh, and also I've got uh, Dr. Luba Prout, who's going to present this session, and I'm going to hand over to her now. And then Jack will come in at the end when it comes to answering the questions. But um, thank you very much for your time. Luba, oh, oh, just say, I'll turn my camera off, not so, so as not to distract you, but I will be here in the background, okay? Luba, over to you. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to share a screen. I don't know if you can see it. Um, I hope so. Yes, you can. Yep, going through great. And I will turn off my video so that you're not distracted. Um, and I'm hoping to make this session a little interactive. I will ask questions throughout the presentations. So please have your phones ready and I'll ask you to scan a barcode and then to um, enter the answer quickly. So as Kim mentioned, my name is Luba Prout 
and I'm a postdoc here at Biochemical Engineering, working on biodegradability and the impact of plastics on the soil microbiome. Can we help avoid a climate crisis? So um, I will start by introducing an outline and uh, we'll talk about um, plastics, a little bit about history, properties, and the reasons behind their widespread use. Moving forward, I'll talk about the relationship between plastics and the environment, and we'll look at the impact of plastics waste on ecosystems and climate. Moving on to types of plastics and biodegradability, we'll categorize these types and focus on their biodegradability. Understanding the differences between these two is absolutely crucial in, address in addressing the environmental issues they pose. So then I'll talk about the soil microbiome. It plays a vital role in the nutrient cycling and symbiotic relationship with plants. We'll then explore the impact of plastics on these microscopic communities. And then uh, in the following section, I'll highlight some solutions and innovations, and then I'll conclude with sort of a recap of what the main points were. And I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. A uh, brief history um, of plastic usage. So the first man-made polymer, parkesine, was introduced in 1869. It was invented in the UK by Alexander Parks, who prepared it from cellulose, treating it with nitric acid. This is regarded as the birth of the plastic industry. In 1907, Leo Bakeland invented Bakelite, the first fully synthetic plastic that contained no molecules that are found in nature. This is made through phenol and formaldehyde. This bakelite was an excellent insulator and it was used really widely um, in telephones, radio, um, as electrical insulators, as jewelry. And then a bit later, in 1930s and 40s, um, there was a huge development of contemporary plastics such as nylon, polystyrene, polyethylene, and others. Uh, the versatility and durability of these plastics led to their widespread use in the variety of fields, including packaging, construction, and um, automotive industry. The demand for plastics material increased significantly during the Second World War, and that led to innovations to an increase in production capacity. Um, plastics are categorized in several different types based on their chemical makeup and properties, and we'll look at some of them just here. So as you all know, polyethylene terephthalate, uh, it's often used in beverage bottles, food containers, or, or as a synthetic fibers such as polyesters. It's known for its strength and thermostability and clarity. And then we have high density polyethylene. It is used for making rigid packaging like milk jugs, detergent bottles, and pipes. It is also known for its strength, durability, and resistance to moisture and chemicals. We have polyvinyl chloride, uh, which is used for making pipes and window frames. It is also used um, uh, for in medical devices and packaging uh, because of its low cost and, and durability. We also have uh, low density polyethylene. Uh, it's used for making flexible items such as plastic bags and squeezy bottles and some tubing. It's very flexible, it's tough and it's transparent. Uh, then there is polypropylene. It's commonly used in containers and toys and um, other important parts of our daily lives like cars. It is known for its resistance to chemicals and heat. We also have polystyrene. Uh, it is used in a wide variety of applications as well from foam cups, insulation, uh, rigid food containers. It is really lightweight and great at insulating things, but it it is also quite brittle. Uh, we also have nylon. It was developed in 1935 uh, um, at DuPont, an American company, one of the largest chemical producers in the world. And it was first um, used for toothbrush bristles. And only later it became sort of uh, famous um, and used in women's stockings. Um, one of the other polymers is polymethyl methacrylate known as acrylic or acrylic glass. It is transparent transparent, and very lightweight and shatter resistant. So used as an alternative to glass. And finally, we have polytetrafluoroethylene, a bit of a mouthful there. Um, and that's why it's known by its brand name Teflon. Um, again, produced at DuPont, 
an American company. It is known for its nonstick properties and used really widely uh, in cookware and various industrial applications. So in here, I would like to ask a quick question. How long do you think um, it takes for a plastic bottle to biodegrade in nature? So I'll give you maybe um, a few seconds to answer that. <laughs> okay. All righty, so some numbers are coming up. Yes. Okay. Okay, let's stop there. So um, the correct answer is actually D. So it takes about 450 years to degrade, but this bracket 400 to 1000 is sort of a rough estimate as to how long it actually takes for a plastic bottle to biodegrade. You can see um, how big of a problem that is um, for the environment. So um, let's take a look at the scale of our relationship with plastics. Uh, the latest trends in uh, production and consumption rates have, in, have reached 400 million metric tons per year. And the cumulative total of plastic produced to date is over 8.3 billion metric tons. I don't think it's actually possible to comprehend just how much that is. So um, just to be able to uh, understand it a little bit, I've uh, sort of equated that to uh, different things that you can really think about. So in terms of football fields, that's 1.1 million football fields. It's 8.3 trillion kilograms and around 5.3 trillion lit liters. So that's huge amounts. And the um, snapshot is that most of the plastic is produced in Asia. So these countries manufacturing uh, most of the plastics and that number is followed by North America and Europe. By the 1960s and 1970s, the environmental impact of plastics waste have um, become a growing concern. So the durability of plastics, uh, once seen as a benefit, has led to um, the significant environmental problems, again, due to their long decomposition times. The recycling symbol was introduced in 1970, and the first Earth Day uh, was celebrated on the 22nd of April, highlighting the growing concern for environmental issues, including plastic pollution. So all the way back in 1970s. Um, current efforts are attempting to address some of the environmental issues and pollution by increasing recycling rates, developing biodegradable plastics and implementing regulations to reduce the single life, uh, single use plastics. So the problem of plastic pollution um, is that it's, um, it's, it's a global problem, and we need to um, promote sustainable use of this material. In an attempt to deal with the plastic waste pollution, many countries opt to outsource the plastic waste to other countries. And this diagram here represents top 10 plastic waste exporters and importers. As you can see, almost all the countries on the left, the exporters, are the developed countries, whereas key importers on the right are mostly, developed, are mostly developing countries that do not have a well-developed or efficient recycling infrastructure. With that in mind, this graph provides a compelling visual comparison of how different regions around the world manage their plastic. And uh, this shows the proportions of plastics that are mismanaged, landfilled, incinerated, or recycled. Um, you can see that some countries contribute more to the plastic pollution compared to others, but um, unfortunately, this isn't as simple as it looks due to, as you have seen, a lot of outsourcing from um, different countries. So one of the ways to deal with that is to work through um, concerted efforts and through a sort of international borders uh, to enhance waste management, recycling, and uh, to reduce the single-use plastics. And here I would like to ask another question. 
um, thinking about uh, thinking about the uh, previous graph about plastic waste, which do you think we could um, do better at? Recycling more, reducing litter, or cutting down on landfill use? Let's have a look. Interesting. Recycling more so far. Okay. Cutting down on landfill use. Good. Okay. Okay, let's stop there. So it's an interesting answer here. So let's let's keep going. Um, now let's look at the pressing environmental challenges posed by the plastics. Um, only around 9% of all the plastic waste produced to date has been recycled. About 20% has been incinerated and 79% of that is accumulated in landfills, dumps and the natural environment. Single use plastics, um, such as water bottles and plastic bags con constitute a significant portion of plastic waste. Over 1 million plastic bottles are purchased every minute globally and up to 5 trillion plastic bags are used worldwide each year. So that's a huge amount of, of plastic, single-use plastic. Um, 99 of that plastic waste is made from fossil fuels, and around 8 million tons of plastic waste enters the oceans each year. Annually, 82 million tons are leaked into the environment, whilst only 3 million tons are recycled. Uh, the plastic production is set to quadruple by 2050, and <laughs> there is a there are unprecedented um, accumulation of microplastics in the environment, and this is concerning because of their ability to enter our food chain. Annually, there are over a hundred thousand ma uh, marine mammals and over one million seabirds killed through ingestion or entanglement, and finally. Plastics has been found in human blood, brain, and placenta. And I have another question here. Um, true or false? Eating a plastic-free meal is impossible. What are your views? So far, it's leaning on to true. Let's see how it goes. Yes, well, um, it is almost true in most cases. It really depends on how your food is packaged and processed. If you're growing your own food, it's less likely to be contaminated with microplastics. If you're buying it, especially if it's highly processed, it's likely that it will contain microplastics. So there you go. Next, we're... <laughs> Looking at what we have, so we have a huge environmental problem. Um, I would say it's an, an environmental crisis. And we need to find ways to um, understand how we got here. And let's look at the types of plastics and their biodegradability. The term biodegradability refers to the um, material's ability uh, to be broken down naturally by microorganisms. Um, the organisms that include bacteria, fungi, maybe algae, and they're broken down into biomass, water, and carbon dioxide, or methane, if this is happening in anaerobic conditions or without air. And this has to happen within a reasonable time frame. This process depends on the chemical structure, the conditions like temperature, oxygen levels, um, presence of organisms, and um, humidity. Biodegradable, biodegradable materials are often contrasted with what we know as non-biodegradable ones, which persist in the environment and uh, that cannot be degraded uh, by natural processes. So this biodegradability of materials is a key consideration in managing waste and minimizing environmental impact. Products and packaging that are biodegradable can help re reduce uh, waste accumulation. However, we have to know specific conditions under which these materials can biodegrade, such as industrial composting or natural environments, and this is crucial for environmental benefits. 
or to maximize more uh, environmental benefits. As shown in this diagram, uh, polyolefins in pink are the largest class of non-biodegradable polymers. Uh, they include polymers such as polypropylene, polyethylene, polystyrene, and these account for 75% of global plastic production at present. Some scientists are working on enhancing biodegradation of these with prooxidants, um, and um, these prooxidants usually um, are um, transition metals such as iron, cobalt, manganese, and copper, and they are um, added up to around five percent um, by weight of the of the product. So the 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 key idea um, is that on weathering, this synthetic polymers can degrade into smaller fragments, and this process is usually triggered by. Uh, sunlight or heat and oxygen with the transition metals acting as catalysts. Um, it is thought that smaller fragments then can be assimilated by microbial organisms and convert into biomass. Uh, however, the degree um, of microplastics then um, and toxicity to microorganisms has not been fully investigated or understood. Uh, the development of biodegradable plastics uh, shown here in green began in 1980s and 1990s. And uh, it was driven by the growing environmental concern and the search for alternatives to petroleum-based plastics. And the key uh, biodegradable alternatives include polyhydroxyalkanoates, um, polylactic acid, polyvinyl uh, alcohol, uh, polybutylene adipoterphthalate, starch, and some um, others. Um, compostable plastics are only a subcategory of biodegradable plastics, and it's designed to biodegrade under composting conditions, uh, and it should degrade into water, carbon dioxide, and some biomass. So the two main types of compostable plastics, um, based on their commercial uh, availability and, and widespread usage, uh, are polylactic acid and polyvitylene terephthalate. Um, while offering a promising solution to this huge plastic pollution problem, these biodegradable plastics come with their own set of challenges. Uh, their effect on soil microbiome is not fully understood. Um, they might promote and encourage, encourage the throwaway culture under the misconception that they don't harm the environment. They create confusion when it comes to waste disposal, which results in the contamination of recycling streams. So, as you can see, importantly, not all biodegradable plastics break down under natural environmental conditions, and some require specific industrial composting conditions, such as high temperature and humidity. Uh, there is also a lack of uniform standards and certification um, for what constitutes biodegradable plastics, and that leads to consumer confusion. So at UCL, uh, we uh, at biochemical engineering in particular as well, we're looking at all these different issues and are investigating the approaches that are best for dealing with the different types of plastics. Uh, let's quickly look at um, the topic of the soil microbiome. As mentioned, among the key factors uh, for, soil, uh, for plastic biodegradation is microbial activity. Uh, soils naturally contain microorganisms such as bacteria, archaea, algae, uh, fungi, uh, which play a crucial ro role in breaking down organic matter into simpler substances that can then be absorbed by the environment. Um, these micro life forms, they, they're everywhere. They inhabit every corner of the world, forming dense networks and interactions with, um, with plants and other bacteria, and they play a crucial ro uh, role in soil health and function. So uh, the, their diversity depends on soil type, climate, vegetation, seasons, practices, and environmental conditions. Um, they support the ecosystem health through various processes. By breaking down the organic matter, they store carbon in, um, in the soil, um, reducing the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. So it's um, carbon sequestration. Then they uh, cycle nutrients back into the soil, and this contributes to soil fertility, uh, which is better for plant growth and enhances photosynthesis, which then in turn removes the CO2 from the atmosphere. 
Um, soils also produce, uh, sorry, soil um, microorganisms produce substances such as humic acid, and this helps bind soil um, particles together, improving soil structure. And this helps with water retention, airflow, plant root um, penetration, and is also uh, beneficial for a symbiotic relationship with plants, which can then um, uh, essentially make more um, oxygen. Um, so a healthy soil microbiome is actually very important as uh, it is more resilient to stresses like disease, drought, and pests. So deforestation, pollution, climate change, uh, they all disrupt uh, microbial communities, which can lead to increased soil erosion and loss of plants, a reduced capacity of soils to store carbon, which exacerbates um, climate change. So these little um, microbes or soil microbiome is absolutely critical for uh, health of our planet. And it's influencing everything from agriculture productivity to climate regulation. The So understanding and protecting this invisible ecosystem is absolutely essential for us and uh, future generations. Um, here is a quick example of microbial communication in soil. The little, I don't know if you can see them, the little balls are signaling molecules used to communicate between microbes. Let's look at the feedback loop between plastic pollution and soil health and climate change. Um, plastic breakdown in the environment releases methane and ethylene. These are two potent greenhouse gases. This process is accelerated um, uh, under the exposure to the sun due to the photodegradation. And um, the microplastics that is resulting from that can affect the microbial production of signaling molecules. Um, and these signaling molecules are absolutely essential for the inter and intra species communication and relationship with plants and nutrient cycling. Microplastics absorb the signaling molecules and some micro microplastics can also release um, additives that can be toxic to soil organisms. It changes the soil structure and disrupts the, uh, the pore connectivity, which is important for the movement of gases and water. So um, this really does degrade and disrupt the soil's ability to process organic matter. As climate change intensifies, um, the partial degradation of plastics in the environment is likely to increase, and this will release even more greenhouse gases. Simultaneously, this will accelerate climate change which can then lead to more natural disasters, which will then lead to more plastic production in response to cha uh, changing circumstances, which will then lead to more plastic pollution. So addressing plastic pollution through um, reducing production and enhancing recycling, as well as cleaning up existing waste uh, can break this feedback loop um, by restoring the, the uh, soil health we can mitigate climate change. And I have another question for you here. So if you were a superhero dedicated to fighting plastic pollution, which superpower would you choose to aid your mission? A, the ability to decompose plastic with a touch. B, X-ray vision to spot and clean up microplastics. C, super speed, um, super speed to rapidly clean up litter and the power to transform plastic waste into renewable renewable materials. And let's see how we're going. <laughs> I like that. A very strong D answer. Great, let's move on. So my recent research involved investigating the effects of OXO and PLA plastics on the soil microbiome. If you remember from a few slides back, the OXO plastics is made from a non-biodegradable polymer such as polypropylene, and it has various different additives added to it 
to speed up the biodegradation. Polylactic acid, or PLA, is a bio-based polymer that is prepared through dehydration process. So lactic acid is a natural molecule that is produced by bacteria as well as mammals and humans. So uh, this slide um, outlines our methodology to investigate the simple changes in the microbial community in soil. We used one gram of soil with 20 milliliters of nutrient-rich solution, and we added a little plastic cut. These samples were incubated at 37 degrees for the OXO experiments and at 50 degrees for the PLA experiments for up to 36 weeks. Uh, to determine if there were any changes to the microbial composition, we collected these samples at various time points. Uh, to begin the analysis, the DNA from each sample, from all organisms present in the sample, was extracted and purified. In the next step, this, what we call metagenomic DNA, was barcoded, pulled together, and then sequenced. Uh, recent developments in the DNA sequencing field allow us to do that locally, locally in our own lab. And we use a special dongle called minion and a flow cell, um, which is a component of that um, uh, technology uh, together with a computer. This process generates DNA reads that are later demultiplexed and sort of untangled into meaningful data using specific workflows developed by the DNA uh, sequencing platform. Uh, speaking of bacteria in particular, some regions of DNA are unique, which allows us to identify and classify organisms to uh, genus and species and maybe sometimes strain level uh, that are present in samples. Once we have this data, uh, we can then analyze microbial distribution in samples and uh, perform statistical analysis on it. So, but due to the vast amount of data, this can only be done computationally using a programming language. Uh, so what did the results show? For the oxoplastics, uh, this was the first study of this kind in the UK. So our experimental conditions mimicked the UK climate uh, or temperate climate. After eight and a half months, we didn't see any biodegradation or any effect of the soil um, on the soil microbiome. The analysis has shown that there is a potential for non-biodegradable types of plastics to have an effect on the soil microbiome, but only after a longer period. So what does that mean? Um, in summary, it indicates that oxoplastics does not degrade any faster than plastics without the uh, prooxidants in, in temperate climates or the UK climate. And this means that we need to think about uh, how to better manage the end of life stage of this product. So we can't just put it in a landfill or into the environment. It will not biodegrade. Uh, with regards to our polylactic acid plastic type uh, plastic, um, earlier studies by the Plastic Waste Innovation Hub here at UCL involved running the big compost experiment, which investigated biodegradable and compostable plastics. On the plastics tested under different home composting conditions, the majority did not fully disintegrate. Uh, that included 60% of the um, plastics that was certified as being home compostable. That's a huge number. And the conclusion of this study was that, uh, unfortunately, uh, this types of plastic is not suitable for um, composting um, in the UK. So since, since that home composting um, of compostable plastics isn't suitable, um, in the UK, our next step was to investigate whether this PLA could be degraded and um, could be degraded at an industrial setting. Uh, so the experimental conditions in my project mimic industrial composting settings, and our results showed that uh, complete degradation of PLA was possible at 50 degrees, and it happened within six to eight weeks, which is a really good result. However, the analysis has shown that there are significant changes to the soil microbiome, and we do not yet know whether these changes are beneficial or detrimental to the soil. So there are two sides of the coin with that. Um, here I'm going to showcase a couple of other projects that we run at UCL. Uh, we're exploring various cutting-edge solutions for plastic waste um, degradation. That includes uh, developing enzymatic routes to degradation. Uh, of different types of plastics, as well as exploring, developing um, different ionic li liquids to speed up enzymatic degradation. 
We work with anaerobic digester to see if some of the plastics degrade better in uh, oxygen-free environments. And um, one of the newer projects also is uh, the development of novel biodegradable polymers uh, for tree shelters. Uh, one of the biggest plastic pollution contributors are, as you know, probably nappies and continents and period products. And here, our new research project at UCL will also conduct uh, several things. Um, it will uh, look at life cycle analysis, behavioral analysis, um, the materials and designs involved and how these can be improved, as well as how we can maybe find a way to um, degrade nappies and those products um, using enzymes, so biochemically. All very exciting. How can we help change our plastic waste trajectory? Um, of course, uh, science-based solutions, innovative uh, recycling technologies, such as chemical enzymatic recycling, development of novel biopaste, biodegradable and compostable products. However, and I guess more importantly, um, social engagement um, is absolutely crucial. So these include the zero waste initiatives, uh, focusing on reducing consumption and increasing reuse and ensuring that all products and packaging can be recycled. And then policy and legislation, which um, bans um, single-use plastics, maybe um, imposing taxes on plastic products, setting recycling targets and supporting research into alternative materials, as well as international agreements to coordinate efforts to reduce the plastic pollution and there is also industry commitments, which um, are looking to redesign products to use less plastic or to use sustainable materials. There is an extended producer responsibility that looks at um, absorbing the entire sort of life cycle of the product from production to um, recycling or end of life. And of course, there are global movements by citizens to uh, clean up plastic waste from oceans and different communities and raising awareness um, for the plastic pollution. It's only by doing all of the above, we can help address global challenges of the plastic pollution. So I've got a question for you. Which one do you think has a greater impact on solving the plastic pollution crisis? So the technological innovation, changing human behavior or none of this or anything else? Let's see. Okay. Yes. Oh, it's gone. I think it's both, but yes, changing human behavior for sure. Yes. So let's move on to quickly um, how we can help. There are very few things each of us um, can do. So it's not using single use plastics choosing unpackaged goods, recycling really well or correctly, um, and advocating for changes, raising awareness through social media, engaging in sustainable programs, volunteering or supporting environmental organizations. There is even an app which is called Little Lotto, where you can um, win money for just putting rubbish into the bins, um, which, is, which is really quite great. So just to sum up, um, in this presentation, I covered a brief history of plastic development. We looked at different plastics products and their uses. We then touched on um, the production rates, waste accumulation, and environmental impact. Um, we um, looked at plastic waste, um, uh, at, sorry, at plastic types and um, their biodegradability. We looked at the soil, microbiome, and its role in ecosystems. And then we looked at the plastics and its effect on the health of the soil microbiome in the context of climate change. I showed a few uh, slides of our projects here at UCL, and we looked at some solution to the crisis. I hope that you don't think that plastic is this evil product. It isn't. Plastic is an amazing invention and many items are extremely useful in everyday part of our daily lives. 
the problem lies with the end of life and uh, waste management and with recycling or lack thereof. Uh, because waste systems and infrastructure are unable to cope with this uh, current amount of plastic waste and production, it's it's us, the consumer, who um, needs to help um, reduce um, the waste uh, and, and plastic consumption. So I've got one final question for you. And it is on a scale one to 10, how optimistic are you about saving, uh, solving the plastic pollution crisis with current biodegradation technologies? Let's see. Not very. <laughs> Well, that's better. One, a few eights. Well, there you go. So we can all do something about it. Thank you. I would like to thank you for your attention. I would like to thank uh, Helen, Mark and Jack who uh, came up with these projects. And um, I would like to thank uh, Natural Environment Research Council for funding. And I've got a few links if you're interested to follow on some of the um, data and current research. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you very much. We've got in people in the chat. I think Kim's always more, uh, wants people to put the, the questions in the Q&A. And then we can, and then when we've answered them, we can check them off. I preempted Kim there because I, I, I've been on a few of these with Kim. <laughs> so sorry, I had I had a little do, scroll scroll of doom for a moment there. So it's that that was don't often get that. Yeah, no, that was fun. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Lou. That was fantastic. Um, I can see the questions coming through uh, in chat. If you could put them in the Q and A, it um, sometimes in the chat they just move it really quickly and we don't get to them. So please put them in the Q and A. Um, you can also post them anonymously if you want to. If you want to ask something really contentious. Uh, you're more than welcome to do it that way. But whilst I'm waiting for you to put your questions in the uh, Q&A box, I just wanted to say um, we've got four more of these uh, sessions coming up. We're doing one on vaccines. Uh, we've got one coming up on immunotherapy. Um, I'll, I'll put links to all of them in the chat whilst we're going through the questions. Um, <clears throat> and also... Uh, uh, I'm going to put a link to this because if you're interested in studying a degree with us, uh, we've got a virtual open. We've got two virtual open days happening on the 23rd and 24th of April, um, and you can come along and you can uh, talk to me and Jack about uh, studying uh, a degree at UCL Biochemical Engineering. We've got BNG, MNG, and BSc programs. Uh, we can we can go into a full deep dive there, answer all your questions about those. If you're in the UK or can come to the UK though, the best option by far is to come and visit us on the 28th or 29th of June because not only will we be able to talk to you but we can show you around our laboratories. We've got a unique facility in the Advanced Centre of Biochemical Engineering. Uh, you can meet our students, you can meet the iGEM team as well, you can talk to our academics. It's uh, a really good fun two days and because we put a lot of effort into it, we only do the open day once a year because it, it's, it's huge uh, and you can get to see UCL, you can get to see the amazing campus we've got here in the centre of London. Um, it's really, really well worth coming to if you can, but if you can't, come along to the virtual session um, and we'll be able to talk to you in detail. Also, over the summer I'm going to be doing a, uh, a webinar with well it's, it's, it's going to be a sort of a, a webinar and then podcast with the igem team we'll talk about them and their research and what they do so um stay in touch but keep an eye out for that stuff but i, I will send you put some details to the other events we've got coming up as well so i can see we've got some questions that have come up um so one person's asked about the entry level entry levels for the programs what i'm going to do is i will answer that in text because i can direct you to the prospectus pages and they've got all the details for all of our programs um and you can you can you can find that there so um Somebody has asked here, what are the current bio, biocontainment strategies for plastic degrading bacteria to ensure the unwanted release of microorganisms into the environment? Uh, Luba, Jack, how would you answer that? Well, I guess maybe I'll start with um, 
the natural bacteria that can degrade plastics, they are already in the environment, they're there. So this isn't something that we need to worry about in terms of containment. If we are in fact engineering microbes, then these are fully contained and they're not released into the environment. So there are strict rules and regulations that ensure that um, companies or universities that deal with sort of modified organisms, they contain them. And that is that is quite strict. So um, in a in a sort of in a summary, um, that there are no sort of um, additional strategies that we need to sort of worry about. What would you add to that, Jack? Yeah, I think that's right. The the rules are quite strict around release of genetically modified organisms. There is intellectual effort, there's academic effort to develop genetic systems, which would mean that any engineered organisms did not have an advantage or could be controlled, but none of those are at a stage where policy is effectively allowing it in the mic in the microbe space, obviously in plant space, we all know about genetically modified organisms and there's contention around that. But in the microorganism space, there's no technology which has been developed, though it is being developed as an academic pursuit, an industrial pursuit, that has convinced policymakers, at least in the UK and in Europe, that release of genetically modified organisms at the microbial level is safe, which is what Luba has said, but in a very long-winded way. And the other thing I would say is, yeah, the wild organisms are already, they're already out there. And one of the things that we've been pursuing is saying, right, can you take these organisms which do it naturally and can you just enrich for them? So can you just grow a load of them and then put them in the environment? And that's kind of gets around it because they're not modified, they're wild type, but you're increasing the chance and the prevalence of them in a particular niche and therefore they will break down more of the plastic. That's one way of sort of engineering the problem and not engineering the organism? That's a good question. Very good question. So there's another, another, another one question that's come up, mm. which, which, is, which is a really interesting question, which is how do microplastics affect the gut microbiome? I know it's probably not your area, but um, it's a really good question. Mm. Gosh, um, there are, I guess, a few issues with microplastics inside a human so it does go through what is known um bbb blood um brain barrier uh, so microplastics has been found in the bloodstream in the brain and it contributes to what is known a plaque so some of the components of the cell they adhere to that and and the plaque is growing within a cell after a while what happens is the uh, the cell dies and that contributes to uh, cell, uh, yeah, cell death. Obviously, not good for us. Um, in terms of the gut, I guess um, it would probably affect some of the organisms and microorganisms in the gut. Um, I'm not really sort of specializing in that area, but I, I'd assume that it would, on some level, affect the gut microbiome in some way. Um, just thinking. Yeah. About it. It's a different. It's a different question. I guess it goes back to what Luba was saying about these plastics and their degradability. So the level of degradation in the human component um, in the period of time that it's there, because obviously a lot of that plastic is in transit, but we're continually dosing ourselves with microplastic, and I get the stuff that gets across. Uh, it's an interesting one, and another. And I don't think we've got a definitive answer. And I'm not so sure there's been a study because the human microbiome is a big area of study and people do comparative studies. So that's a really good question. It might be a good, really good research question actually to investigate, see whether these plastics make a difference on the human microbiome. And of course, there's lots of different types of plastics. I think the majority one would probably be PET because if you think about most of the plastics we use for food, water in particular is PET. Um, and what's the plastic in food containers, Lupo? Is polypropylene, do you think, or polystyrene? Uh, it's not such a or DPE. Yes, yeah, different. Polyethylene, it's all of it. So you're continually dosing all of these things. There was a really interesting paper recently where someone found a really good enzyme for degrading PET, and they found it in the human oral microbiome from bacteria that grow in and on around and on our teeth. And it seemed strange at first, but then you realize that, you know, obviously in dental hygiene, you get tartar buildup, you get plaque buildup, and these are sites of quite like long term, you know 
citing of bacteria and those microplastics getting caught in there in that in that plaque and then so you know it's a carbon source of these bacteria so when you start to think about these things it, you can understand why you might get organisms which break down plastic in, in in that environment i think probably i mean i'm going to go out on a limb and say the levels of breakdown would be so low as to maybe not affect the microbiome so much but i think that's definitely an area of, of interest and i think the other thing a lot of people worry about with plastics in the human body is leaching so a lot of these plastics are not just the polymers but they'll have other things in there to give them different material properties like softeners uh, phthalates is a big one and those things are a bit more soluble and, and and can have other effects so it's not just the plastic itself it's the oftentimes the modifiers that are put in them which can have a big different diff, um, impact on human on human health so that's a long way again of not really answering the question but saying it's really an interesting one and i think there's lots of things to think about in it and lots of research to be done in it I just to say another reason for not chewing the end of your pen as well. Not chewing the end of your pen. I think I think the thing about long that is interesting. You know, Luba put up that slide which said how long does it take for these things to degrade? And it was like four hundred to a thousand years. And then you think about plastics as a material that have been around for <coughs> what sixty and seventy years. Most of them from the mid fifties. So if you think about it in that respect, every plastic that's ever been made in human history still exists out there in the environment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Every think... nappy that's every nappy that's ever been used. Anything like that, any wipe, everything like that is still all out there, unless it's been burnt, of course. And, and a lot of it does go to incineration. Mm -hmm. But if it goes to landfill, it's still out there, you know, uh, in, in the soil, in the ground. That's a huge, huge thing to think about. Um, the last question we've got, which is, is, is kind of outside our field, but, but you might be able to answer mm -hmm. it, which is what's the difference in carbon capture and carbon sec sequestration? Um, I mean, that's, that's a really good question. Sure. Um, I, I don't. I mean, have we have we done any work in carbon capture? We, uh, we don't do a lot in carbon capture uh, in the way that people are probably thinking about it online, which is about CO two extraction from the air. But of course, microorganisms can do that. I guess the thing, the difference between carbon capture and carbon sequestration is that well, you need to capture carbon to sequester it. And if you catch a carbon, you don't necessarily have to sequester it. You could always just re-release it. So usually they come together, carbon capture and sequestration, sequestration, CCS, right? So you have the process of drawing it down from the atmosphere and then you've got to store it somewhere. And how do you store it? Now, in a biological context, plants and trees and all photosynthetic organisms capture and fix carbon and sequester it in carbohydrates. Yeah, And then if they go into the ground, that's, you know, we understand how fossil fuels, that's a very biological way of um, carbon capture and sequestration, yeah? Uh, but the physical ones, the engineering ones, are much more about, yeah, the physical processes of CO2 extraction from the environment. Um, so I guess that's the answer to that question. I mean, it's it's more of a distinction than a difference. Carbon, carbon capture is the process of drawing it out of the air, and the sequestr sequestration is then how do you store that long term? And of course, there's different ways you could do that. But um, I mean, if you if you got an eye on um, a Nobel Prize for yourself, finding a way of doing it biologically uh, would be excellent. And also, bear in mind, I, I guess the sheer amount of carbon dioxide that is captured by algae and then drops into the sea. Uh, Absolutely. I mean, it's 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 got amazing potential. That's so. If you if you'd like to do that in a few years, we'd love you to get a Nobel Prize for the department. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so, I mean, I mean that goes back to what Luke was talking about bio recyclable materials. There's a huge amount of in, uh, intellectual pursuit into algae for biofuels. So instead of sequestering the carbon, effectively what you do is bring it back into the cycle or and shorten the cycle, because obviously the carbon cycle is millennia, right, to fossil fuel, which we've been burning. But if you can do that turnaround in days, so from CO2 to biofuel, then you you, you close that loop. That's not going to be the solution to the to, to the problem of, of climate change. Absolutely not. Uh, we have to sequester CO2 from the atmosphere and block it away as it was in fossil fuels before it was burnt uh, to maintain the temperatures that we're used to. That's that's a, that's that's a must. But we've also just got to stop pumping it into the environment because we just continually pump it into the atmosphere. Yeah. So <laughs> you know it's a bit of which one first. Probably both at the same time is is needed. <laughs> Okay, well, we've come to the end of our session. Oh, um, okay. There's, 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 uh, th there's one question that's come in, which is about um, how many people. I mean, I can, I, I can. I mean, we can answer this one yeah. quickly. Uh, it's about how many people roughly study biochemical engineering undergraduate. 
Uh, undergraduate, it's around a hundred pound, a hundred people 100 per. Pounds. A hundred, it's, it's not a hundred pounds. It's a hundred, hundred people per cohort. It's roughly in that area. MSCs, it varies from sort of forty to sixty year on year, depending on many yeah. many factors. Yeah. And, there and that's few... that's split across the three streams we do. So we have BSc, MEng, and BEng, and so there's that that ninety eight split across those three. So it's about it's about fifty for the integrated BEng MEng. So, but that's so, yeah. that's all you can find that all at our next talk, which is about admissions. <laughs> Absolutely, um, and also, also we, we'll be doing sessions uh, in over the summer as well. If you want to talk to our current students, um, they're great people to ask about stuff like this because they'll tell you what it's like being in the department. But um, I'm going to wrap up now. But I want to say a huge thank you to everyone who's taken your time to come and join us today. It's been great to have you with us, and and a massive thank you to Luba for the presentation. Thank you, Luba. I really enjoyed it's been that. Great. Thank you. And, and it's uh, it's been great to see. You. And I hope to see you for some more of these sessions. And most of all, I hope to see you in person at some point in UCL. Absolutely. Okay. Have a great afternoon. All the best. Right. Bye. -bye. Thank you, Luba. Thank you, everybody. We'll see everybody out. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Have a good day.